church? You sound bright and lively. Isn't today an awesome day to praise the Lord? Whoa, I didn't expect that. Isn't today an awesome day to praise the Lord? Amen. Every day is an awesome day to praise the Lord. You know, that's what we were made for. From the beginning of time, God has been drawing people from every nation, tribe, and tongue to himself so that they might come to be redeemed and know him and sing of his excellencies and his virtues. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but is that going to stop us from worshiping? No, but we are going to go old school. You're going to have to use your hymn books this morning. So take out your hymn books, turn to, to, to page 76, hymn number 76, O oh, for a thousand tongues. And why don't you stand and let's sing with me, sing with me together.
make sure to turn your eyes towards the screen. You've obviously just seen many reminders from Scripture about God's presence with you, His knowledge of you, His care for you. We're going to talk today about the fear of loneliness. And you would think that all those kind of promises and truths about God should be enough to deal with any fear of loneliness. But I think there's something missing. And I want us to explore that today. For the rest of our time of worship, listen to the songs as we sing them, as you let the words really penetrate your mind and your heart, and be reminded of those wonderful promises of God. But I do think that there is often something in our lives that is still missing, and that's what I want us to explore today. If you are a guest with us, I particularly want to welcome you. Thank you for choosing to spend this time with us. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to let us know who you are and also if there's any way that uh, we could provide information for you or assist you. You notice when you open our bulletin, there's a welcome card. If you could take a few moments to fill out some information, check any boxes that might be appropriate, and then tear it off along the perforation and a little later in the service when the offering plate comes by, just place the card into the offering plate. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. And turn to hymn number 345. Let me ask you, what's your story this morning? You have a testimony of God's grace and mercy and power and his glory in your life? If your life, God forbid, were to suddenly be over, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you have that blessed assurance that you know Jesus? Or are you such that he would say, depart from me, I never knew you? Listen and worship with me as we sing blessed assurance. We who call on the name of the Lord can know for sure that we have eternal salvation because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Please stand and sing this song with me together. 345. Let us sing.
course again without the instruments. This is my story. This is my song. Some of you may not have that as a testimony, maybe because you don't know him. And this is the day. The day is the day of salvation. But there are others here I know. You know the Lord, but it's still hard to sing that song in spirit and truth because in honesty, you're not happy and blessed. And I just want to encourage you, again, with the words of Scripture, some of which you've seen and, and, you, and you know. But let, just close your eyes and let me read this to you from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you examine me. And no, you know when I sit down and when I get up, even from far away, you understand my motives. You carefully observe me when I travel or when I lie down to rest. You are aware of everything I do. If I were to say, certainly the darkness will cover me and the light will turn night all around me. Even the darkness is not too dark for you to see. And the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Certainly, you made my mind and heart. You wove me together in my mother's womb. And I will give thanks because your deeds are awesome and amazing. You knew me thoroughly. We have a course that we're going to going to sing. It's very simple, but I don't, you won't have the words. But um, as you catch on, please, please join in with me.
that I feel discouraged Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely And long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion My constant friend is he I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender voice I hear and resting on his goodness. My doubt and fear, though by the path he leads, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. as me whenever I am tempted whenever clouds arise when songs give way to sighing and hope within I draw the closer to him From care he'll set me free His eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches me the sparrow and I know he cares for me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the And I know he watches me. Yes, I know he watches me. Join me if you would in prayer. Father, we thank you for that reminder 
that you're watching us and you care for us and you love us. Father, our desire is to trust in you and our entire life um, and everything for all our sustenance, for, for all the things that we try to accomplish. Uh, we want to trust in you, for you alone are God. And, and Lord, your care does constantly, amazes us. <clears throat> Father, help us to dwell among our neighbors and, and to cultivate faithfulness. Um, we want to bless you at all times. And, and Lord, we want your praise to be continually on our lips. And, and together, Lord, we want to exalt your name uh, because we belong to you. Uh, we cried out to you and you heard our cry and you pulled us out of that slimy pit and you put our feet upon a rock and and made our footsteps secure. Lord, our salvation is from you and you alone, and, and you're our stronghold in times of, 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 of t trouble, and, and it's your help that delivers us because we take refuge in you. You are, you are our God, Lord. We are your people, and we commit ourselves to you. We commit our ways to you. Uh, trusting uh, that you will make our path straight. Help us to be good followers, even in those hard times when we can't see uh, our next steps, that, Lord, that we would rest and lean on you. Father, we come because sometimes that journey is hard and praying for those within our congregation. Um, you know, sometimes there's just uh, hard places in our lives, and we thank you that we're not alone, that you're there for us. And, Lord, we pray for Bob Watson and just continued healing after his heart surgery. And, and we pray for Susan, for uh, his wife, for the uh, cancer. And Lord, their, their plate is uh, pretty full, and yet you're, they're trusting you to be a bigger God than, than all their problems. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for those that are facing cancer and that this would be a time that they would draw near to you. We pray for, for Paul Thomas. And, and Roy Jowers, and, and Tom Beam, and Joanne Zahong, and Susan Varenz, and, and uh, Anna Renault. Lord, uh, we just pray that you would work uh, in their lives uh, according to your purposes, and that they would just see constantly your hand, your care, your provision. And Father, we pray for Bud Spiker, and Linnea Tinker, and uh, Betty Nilsson, and some of the, these uh, long-term things that are going on in their life and that they would just be able to draw strength from your presence, knowing that you never leave, never forsake, that you're always there. Father, there's other needs here uh, besides health. You know, there's financial needs and there's uh, relational needs and there's anxieties and fears. There's um, safety concerns. There, there's just so many things going on. And, uh, Father, if we find ourselves just wringing our hands, uh, we pray that you would just teach us to put our hands in yours. Those hands that looked at the storm and said, Peace, be still, and it stopped. And that, Lord, that we would draw our peace from you. This morning we come and bring our gifts uh, as an act of worship. Uh, Father, we do adore you. Uh, we thank you. You're the... The most awesome God, in the, you know, that we could ever imagine. And yet you're still even beyond what we imagine. And so we come to just to say this morning, we love you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Loneliness. <clears throat> it's that feeling of emptiness or hollowness. It's that sense of being isolated, separated, and cut off. Um, I think all of us experience loneliness, but perhaps in different ways. Sometimes it's just a, a, a vague feeling that something is not right, kind of a minor emptiness. For others, it's the very deep kind of loneliness that comes after losing someone that you love. You might feel lonely because you are actually alone. <laughs> you know, working late in the office in the part of the building that's separated from everybody else and the entire shift night after night, you're the only one that's there. But loneliness is not the same as being alone. Many of us, in fact, look forward to sometimes when we are alone, when we can unwind, when our batteries can be recharged. Um, or you could even be surrounded by people at a party uh, and still be overcome by a sadness and a sense of being alone. So you see, it's really not about the number of people around you at all, is it? It's about the connectedness that you have. It's about the interaction that you have with people. The fear of being alone is that dreadful feeling of emptiness caused by the absence of connection, the absence of interaction with another person. It's doing something and nobody notices. Nobody cares doesn't matter whether you did it or not. Loneliness often shares the same space with grief. And those who have lost a loved one know this very dearly. Grief uh, is like a young widow who is trying to raise her three children, but now all alone. The loneliness and the grief is like the man who begins each day with a walk to the cemetery and spending a few moments there in front of the grave before he goes on with his routines. Part of him goes to work, part of him is there in the cemetery. Loneliness and grief is, is like that silent knife-edged terror and sadness that comes a hundred times a day when you start to tell a story, you start to speak to someone who's not there anymore. It's a grief, an emptiness, that comes when you eat alone after having shared so many, many meals with someone else. 
It is teaching yourself to go to bed without saying good night to the one who's died. But loneliness may also come when you have yet to find someone, not just when you lose someone. And some of you, not married, waiting, looking, hoping for the right one, and right now you feel very much alone. It's loneliness, and we are afraid of it. God's people have known deep loneliness all throughout time. In fact, there's some examples in Scripture. The prophet Elijah, I think, is a, a very good example that I want us to think about today. Ahab, who was the king of Israel at that time, he had seen God do extraordinary things. Uh, king Ahab had seen uh, God bring... Um, a drought and famine on the land for three years, just as God had promised. And, and then the king saw a fire come down out of heaven and consume a, a sacrifice, and not just the, the animal that had been sacrificed there, but the wood and the stones, even the water all around it, because it had been drenched in water. The king had seen... God send rain after three and a half years of drought, just as predicted. But of course, for all the disaster that the king saw, he didn't attribute it to God. He blamed Elijah for it. And Elijah had just been responsible for killing 450 prophets of Baal in an attempt to call the people of Israel back to God. Baal prophets had served the king Oh, excuse me, served Queen Jezebel. They were her kind of stormtroopers, if you want to think of them that way. Um, they were loyal to her, and when Ahab reported back to his wife that Elijah had killed them all, it's Elijah's fault. He's to blame. Well, Jezebel, the queen, was as much a pagan as you could get. She had a reputation for evil, and she had already been doing her best to exterminate every single prophet, true prophet of God, throughout the land. She had killed many of them already. And now, when she heard that Elijah had been responsible for killing her prophets, her stormtroopers, she sent a messenger to Elijah with this promise. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. You are a dead man. Well, you know, really though, if she wanted to kill Elijah, she could have done so quickly, quietly, because that was her pattern. She did it all the time anyway. Not just send a warning. So it seems that what she really wanted was to discredit him in front of all the, the people of Israel who apparently had now professed faith in Yahweh when they saw the, the fire come down from heaven and the prophets of Baal killed. Oh, yes, we worship Yahweh. But she wanted to discredit their leader because every rebellion is going to fall apart if the leader is discredited. She didn't want him to be a martyr that they would all sing praises to for years to come. She wanted to ruin his reputation. And so Elijah, Elijah is afraid. I mean, he, but the strange thing is, he had also seen God do extraordinary things. In fact, more than the king Ahab, he had um, seen God feed him by ravens during that drought and famine time. He had seen a widow's uh, oil and flour keep... Um, miraculously filling the pots, filling the containers every night so there was always enough for them. Um, he had even seen a, a widow's son resurrected from the dead. And now he has single-handedly stood alone against all of those prophets of Baal, and he won. For the last three and a half years, he has been trusting God through hard times, and many of those hard times have been very lonely but now, something snapped. Something snapped in him. Like all the past, all that he has seen from God is forgotten. And the fear of loneliness comes crashing down on him and paralyzes him. He ignores the dramatic 
conversion of the people on that mountaintop. He, he, he forgets the courageous faith of another prophet by the name of Obadiah, not the one in Scripture, but one who was a, a supporter, a protector for him. He blames the people for Jezebel's threat. And he sees himself as utterly abandoned, cut off, and alone. And so, what does a person who is abandoned and cut off do? He retreats. And so he ran as fast as he could down south to the very southernmost town of, of the nation, Beersheba. And he told his servant, you stay there, I'm going on. That's what loneliness does. See, he has no plan to return. This is it. I'm over. Uh, I'm done with this. And, and loneliness tends to make loneliness even deeper. You feel all alone. You feel abandoned. So even those who might be close to you, and all Elijah felt he had left was his one servant, he even cuts him off. See, I really am alone. And he flees another 15 miles out in the desert, sits under a huge kind of desert tree, big branches, some sort of a shade, but he falls asleep, emotionally exhausted. He cries out to God while he's there under that bush. God, Lord, I have had enough. Will you take my life now? I am no better than my ancestors. They have not been able to accomplish anything good for you. I haven't been able to accomplish anything good for you. My life is wasted. And I'm alone. I want to die. And he falls back asleep. Interestingly, sleep is often an escape for lonely people. Because at least in their dreams, they don't feel as alone. Loneliness does this. When you think that all that's left is just me, you cannot help but have your thoughts all about me. Right? I mean, it's natural. But the problem is, it creates a selfishness that Satan will feed Feed this consuming fire with accusations and self-pity and fear until all we want is, for some of us, even the ultimate selfishness, death. No thoughts about how it's going to affect other people who had been looking up to him now as the one who is going to lead us to Yahweh. No thoughts about what God thinks about this. It's all about me and my escape. But Elijah is not alone. God is still there with him. All those promises were not empty promises from God. And so as Elijah, again, sleeps under the tree, totally exhausted, an angel comes and touches him. Wake up, wake up. I have food for you. You need to eat. You need to drink. He wakes up and he sees a fire there and bread baked and water there and he eats and he drinks and then he falls asleep again because sleep is where a lonely person can escape. Again, the angel touches him, shakes him awake. Get up, you've got to eat. And again, there's another meal and water and he eats and he drinks. And, and the angel says to him, you have a long journey ahead of you, but I want you to know I'm providing for you. You're not alone. Elijah continued south to Mount Horeb, to Mount Sinai. You know, it's really interesting. It's only about a 14-day trip by foot to get to Mount Sinai. You know Mount Sinai, right? Where the law was given, Moses and the shaking mountain and all that sort of thing. It's only another 14 days to get down there by foot, but it took him 40 days. Don't know why, but it took him 40 days. Going to the mountain of God, where Moses was. Oh, 40 days, that kind of sounds like Moses. 40 years in the wilderness, Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. And it says that he came to the cave, not any old cave, but the cave. Could it be the cave where tradition had told him Moses 
was. And Moses had said, God, I want to see your glory. Don't know for sure, but it's like a deja vu all over again. <laughs> As some people say. There he is with Moses. The next day, God asked Elijah, so Elijah, what are you doing here? Obviously, I didn't send you. Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. He no longer saw God's grace, God's presence in his life. He was consumed with the fear of loneliness and all he could see was darkness. He forgot about everything that God had done for him or the fact of what God was still doing for him on this trip down to Mount Sinai. God didn't send him there. Fear did. And so God told Elijah to stand outside of the cave in the presence of Yahweh because Yahweh was going to pass by. Sounds again a lot like Moses, doesn't it? Hide there in the cave, cover you with my hand, and you'll see my glory pass by. But before Elijah got to the entrance of the cave, to get out there was a powered show like Moses had seen, with, with wind and storm and fire like a volcanic eruption and the ground was shaking. I don't know if some rocks were falling from the ceiling in the cave. God is coming. It was just like Moses. It was just like all the prophets had talked about. This is what happens when God himself shows up. But God was not there in those things like he had been with Moses. God's presence was not there in the wind or the fire or the earthquake like it had been with Moses. Instead, God spoke in a gentle whisper. And Elijah came out with his head covered in reverence. I think the point is pretty clear. Elijah, you don't need volcanic power to deal with your problems. You need to listen to my voice and I'm here. When I said earlier this during our worship service that many of us know the promises of God. We've sung them, we've read them, we can recite them. But it seems like there needs to be something more because many of us are still trapped in the fear of loneliness. And I think there is something more. Elijah certainly knew the promises of God. And even though God said in a gentle whisper, I'm here, still it had the loneliness had a deep hold on him. Even God's power, even God's presence. Elijah still felt the same about himself and he said to God, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. It sounds like a tape recorded message, doesn't it? Thank you for calling. Please pick, you know, leave your message kind of thing. And we give it right back to God in our, in our fear of loneliness because all we can see is to the tip of our nose and no further because I'm all alone. What did God do? He whispered again. He spoke again. He said, listen to my voice. Listen to this clearly, what I'm going to say. Elijah, go back. Go back the way you came. And then he tells him, I have a mission for you. 
Three things interrelated. I want you to anoint a new king for Aram, which is like Syria. And that king is going to attack and judge Israel for their idolatry. And I want you, secondly, to go and anoint a new king for Israel who is going to exterminate the whole household of Ahab because of the idolatry for Baal worship. Third, I want you to anoint Elisha, another prophet who is going to pick up the mission where you will leave off and continue on. Elisha, I have a job for you to do. The mission continues. You need to go back. Oh, and by the way, I reserve 7,000 in Israel. You are not alone. There are 7,000 others who are faithful to me. God's people, you see, have known loneliness but so has Jesus. You realize that? So has Jesus. Not only did all of his disciples abandon him in the end, but even the Father. From the cross he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so when God speaks to you and to me about loneliness, he knows what he's talking about because he had it himself. He knows you are not forgotten. You are not forgotten. Loneliness can crush the greatest resolve and courage that you and I might muster. We're going to do something great for the Lord. We're going to really turn our life around here, but then we feel like we're all alone and nobody is with us and nobody is supporting us, and, and courage just melts. Loneliness can erase the greatest memory, thinking back to what God has done in your life and, and just the, the wonderful changes he's brought and the blessings he's brought and the family and the protection and, and, and the money in the right time, but all those thoughts erase, evaporate because of loneliness. Loneliness makes it so hard to keep on. It can take away your appetite, leave you unable to cope with the routines of life. You can't even get out of your jammies in the morning. Excessive self-pity, wishing for death. You're unmoved by visitors even when they do come because you feel like they don't really want to connect. And you're unmoved even by a visit from God. Humans are notorious for forgetting. We are, I know that. Mortality guarantees it, that we will forget. And that's not just because of Alzheimer's. Husband and wife argue about something in the past. She sees it one way, he sees it another. Of course, a smart husband knows she saw it right. <laughs> you know, this, it's, who's right here? Who remembers correctly? I have a picture of my great-grandfather up on one of the shelves in my office. Fortunately, I have a, a little book that he wrote. It's, it's wonderful. It, tell, it told about a little bit about his life, more about times, economy, and so on, you know, in the mid-1800s. And, and, and it's a great little book. But that's all I know about him, really. I know even less about my grandfather. I feel like maybe at times I know even less about my father. Mortality kind of does that. We don't really know people. Wouldn't it be great if somebody really knew and remembered? Rather than people remembering you, what if there was someone who could never forget? There is. Lonnie read from Psalm 139. Let me pick up a little bit of that. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to try to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, 
I am still with you. When I pull myself out of that sleep that has tried to escape, I find there you are, sitting beside my bed. You've been there all night long. And you're there first thing in the morning, still thinking about me. That's who he is. That's how he is. The one who would rather die than let you go. You are not forgotten. In fact, it says there in Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and he's always thinking about you. In the New Testament, in Romans 8, describes, first of all, the suffering of this world. You look around us, and it's like this whole world is going down the toilet. But even the Spirit himself is eager about what's coming. Creation is longing for God to make things right. We are longing for Jesus to return. And it describes in the Spirit himself his groaning. It's like the Spirit is standing on tiptoes, looking as far as he can, which only he can do further than all the rest of us. And he knows what's coming. And he is eager, standing on tiptoes, anticipating when God is going to make us fully like Jesus, when we are finally home with him. You see, we are not forgotten. We are not forgotten. You are not forgotten. Secondly, you are not alone. You are not alone. Mortality, again, so often rips people apart in our lives. We have to say goodbye to those that we love, those who die, and and then even changes in our life move us apart and change dynamics and situations. So many times the connections that you have right now, you anticipate they're going to be broken someday. It's like we know, like death, that we know is coming. We know these changes are going to happen. People are going to leave. But just like death, we hate it. We fear it. If only there was someone who would never abandon me. (laughs) My hand goes, I know someone. If only there was someone who could never leave me alone. Another hand. I know someone, right? Your shepherd, your father, your savior, lover. The one who said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And I will be with you all the way until the day when I come back to take you with me. In Hebrews chapter 13. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, the Lord says. Never. Never. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Because what can mere mortals do to me? You are not alone. All right, but here we come to the bottom line. You and I say, but I need something more. All these wonderful promises, I know them, I've memorized them, I sing them, I say them, but I need something more. If I'm going to make it, I need a Moses-like experience to know that God is still with me. I need proof. I need something big and powerful. But what God gives more often than a powerful miracle is the extraordinary gentle whisper that says, don't fear, I'm here. In that whisper, God also says, listen carefully, I have things I want you to do. So step out and get involved. I think this is the missing piece. This is where many times we fail, where we are stuck in our loneliness and in the fear of it. God says, step out and get involved. That's what he's whispering. We have little control over the cause of most other fears. The fear of the unknown, hey, it's unknown, so we have no control over it, right? It's coming. (laughs) You can't stop it. The fear of pain. You're not going to remove all pain. It's coming. You have no control. Death. You're going to die. You don't have control over it. 
We have little control over those kind of fears. But the fear of loneliness is different. It is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The loneliness is often something that we create or at least make worse ourselves. When we withdraw, when we retreat from something painful or unwanted, suddenly we find ourselves all alone because we have withdrawn, we have retreated. And that leaves us even more isolated. Yes, it's good to know that our good shepherd is with me and will never leave me. But we long for flesh and blood to be near. And you see, loneliness is even more unbearable when we're waiting and we're waiting for somebody, flesh and blood, to come near, and they don't. They don't seem to care. They don't pay attention. But did you hear what God told Elijah? He said, go back. There's work to do. Not with a great power, not with fire and wind, but in the quiet routine of obedience where you've got to get up in the day and you've got to get dressed and you've got to go out and you have people to meet. That's where it's going to happen. It will have an even greater impact than you saw back when you didn't feel alone. Because what's coming here is not just a temporary setback in Baal worship. It's going to be the complete removal of it, and you're going to be a part of that. You will see that you are not alone, that you are, in fact, part of a company of heroes. Do you want that? Because that's what's next. That's the work. But you've got to step out and get involved. Loneliness is passive. It is kept going by passively letting it continue and doing nothing about it. We hope it will go away, but we do nothing except let it envelop us in fact, some of us even embrace it, hold tight to it like a security blanket. Because if nobody else is giving us attention, at least we can give attention to ourselves. And we're sinking down into a depression, a helplessness, and even more passive. So what do you do? Well, first, admit that you're feeling lonely. Admit what you're feeling. Express those feelings. Maybe write them down and think about and discover what other feelings are connected to the loneliness that I feel. Do I also feel anger? Do I feel sadness? Do I feel frustration? And write it down. Write it down. Make a list. And, or, or just write out a story, a paragraph. Just let it pour out what you're feeling and then speak those feelings to God. Sometimes what you're going to have to speak to him is repentance to say, God, I have been awfully, awfully selfish. I've been so angry and I have cut myself off from people. And God, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I need wisdom from you because right now I feel just so alone and so paralyzed. I need to hear your voice to say what it is you want me to do. But I also need strength from you to step out and do it. Speak these things to God, but then also perhaps stop being passive and active and share it with a friend, a trusted friend. Express your grief if it's been a loss. Let it out. But most importantly, above everything else, listen up, most importantly, above everything else, don't sit around waiting, hoping for someone to come and to fulfill your need for connections Step out and get involved. Involved in some activity with other people. Provide some structure to your day so that you have to get up and you have to get dressed and you have to go out and you have to do things and you have to connect and meet with someone. Something that you can look forward to. You might need to really push yourself in this, particularly if you have felt alone for a long time. You need to push yourself, but this is the call of God in your life because it isn't over yet and he hasn't left yet. 
I like alone times. I get, I get recharged sometimes through alone times. But at the same time, I often, it gets to be too prolonged. And in the sense of my mind and my heart, I feel like connections are broken off. And I begin to get really sad about that and depressed. Well, recently I officiated at a wedding. And the difference in this wedding, I, I knew the bride. I just had met the groom, some in pre previous counseling, which was very brief because somebody else did the counseling, and I knew nobody else in the entire room. Nobody else. The whole wedding was built around interactions and fellowship. Now, my typical being would... Okay, I do the ceremony, I do my part, and I just kind of, you know, I'll stand in the corner, way back in the corner, and just kind of, or I'll sit in a chair and just kind of watch and nod and smile kind of thing. And I've done that before, and to be honest, I leave that and I say, nobody noticed me. I'm so alone. I said, this time's going to be different. Before the wedding got started, I, would, I started going around to everybody, particularly those who look like they might be part of the wedding party. I'd say, so what's your connection? I'd ask questions. What's your connection to? And do you do the same thing he does? And, and, and so I'd just probing questions, and you know, they'd start to share, and, and they'd tell a little story about something, and it'd prompt me to I'd remind me of a story, so I'd tell a little, little story, but then I'd ask a question again because I want to find out more about them seated at a table with people I had no idea who they were, the reception following. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was exciting because I had asked God to do this, you know. And I just started asking questions and getting to know them. And our table was the liveliest table in the whole room. We were laughing, we were joking. We were, and uh, at first, everybody else was just as quiet because they didn't know each other either. You know, almost sus suspicious. And I just started telling who I was and telling stories or, or asking questions and telling stories and so like that. I heard afterward from some people secondhand through the bride that said, people really enjoyed you being there. And they just had fun visiting. And I'm thinking, I hardly ever hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because... I don't often step out and get involved like that. But God does some good things when you do. You're going to have to push yourself, though. You have to push yourself to do it. In loneliness, we often wait for someone to come and be our friend, to fill the hole. But you see, God keeps telling us to go, to get involved, because that's how he does it. That's how he works Jesus, from, from the command to go and make disciples to Jesus, love them as I have loved you. Well, he went and talked and connected. So get involved with others as a believer on mission, a mission of love. It's so much better than waiting for somebody to come and give you care because chances are they're waiting too. And they won't come. But when you step out, that is where God is at work. That is where God is at work. And it is just like Jesus does. It creates an opportunity for the power of the Spirit to do extraordinary things. In fact, Scripture even says that if you're single, that can be a real benefit. Stepping out and making connections. Not to try to find a spouse... Because, by the way, if somebody else who's single sees you on the prowl trying to find a mate or trying to find a husband or wife, if they respond to that, they're probably not the kind of person you want to be married to. But if they're looking for somebody who cares, who gives, who makes connections, and you're that person, you see, then they have a heart for, like Jesus too, so do you. It's where God works. Getting involved with others. It's like Jesus. You say, if I do that, will it be the same as before, before I was lonely? Probably not. Probably not. It won't be like when you were married. It won't be like when that loved one was there. 
there's still that loss. But friends, this is what I say from Scripture's authority. It can be even better and bigger. It can be even better and bigger because now you are trusting God probably in a way that you never had to before. Secondly, you are choosing to put him first by stepping out when before you didn't have to step out. You had maybe somebody else to do that or you just kind of went along with your tight little circle. You didn't have to do it in your own. But now you're in a place of exposure, but you're also in a place where God is at work and he has said, I'm there with you and I'm going to strengthen you for this journey because I'm with you. And the very power and presence of God is going to outshine anything that you had before. So maybe at church you come here and you sit and you feel so alone. You're waiting for somebody to come and greet you. Why not instead target someone to say, I'm going to ask some questions. Who they are? Do they have a family? What brought them to 4C here? And just start to ask questions and listen. And maybe if a story is prompted, I'll tell a story. Maybe get involved in a home group. A place of connection. Maybe a ministry here or in your community. Uh, take a missions trip or, or uh, connect with people in visiting. There are so many people out there who need a visit. And you say, who, who should I go visit? Call the office. We can give you some names. Maybe it's giving rides to people. I don't know who needs a ride. We'll call the office. We'll help you. There's a survey out on the, the table there in the lobby, a worship arts survey, a blue form. Uh, a box to put the blue form in that ask you, what's your music interests? What are your abilities? If you don't have any abilities, what are your interests? Another place, an opportunity, maybe God will use to make connections. But bottom line, simply this. I'll say it, then we'll leave it. But don't leave it. Go. God has work for you. Father, I thank you that you said, do not fear, I am with you. But Father, for us to know that, we have to be with you in the places where you are working and the connections that you are making with people. So instead of waiting for a friend, Father, I ask for my friend, brothers and sisters in Christ. Instead of waiting for a friend, help us to be that friend, knowing that you are with us and there's work to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to hymn number 419. And let this be our prayer that God would abide with us.
I hope each of us heard God speak to us in a very particular way today through his word. Because there isn't a reason to fear loneliness, it's going to happen, it's going to come. There are times when you will be alone. But there isn't a reason to fear it because he says, I'm with you. Now go, step out, go where I am and see the connections that I have for you to make bigger and grander than anything you've seen before. Because you're not alone. You're part of a company of heroes, and I'm there with you. So go in his grace, his strength, his power, his presence.